You treat those parameters are time varying, or treat those time uh, parameters are time varying time series, then do a dynamic modeling on the coefficients. Then, in this way, you also build a, a dynamic structure. So, it took me uh, quite a while, that means a couple of years, eventually come up with an idea which I'm going to present to you. I think, uh, in a way, it's generic enough, on the other hand, it's simple enough to be practically useful. But uh, you will tell me whether we have achieved our goal. Here, we put the example in two classes. The first of what we talk about is, okay, this curve time series means each time, each time t, we observe a curve, y t, okay? And this curve is defined on an interval, we assume it's a bounded interval or compact set, r. This curve could be, say, any weather record, like a temperature curve, or any production sales and volatility curves, this is one type of curve. This curve, you can think of, actually, it's a long time series. Yeah? You cut them in pieces. You treat each piece as one observation. Okay? And uh, the reason for doing that, we will see, hopefully, towards the end. And another type of the curve time series is the following, like the mean balance efficient frontier portfolio, and yet curve I mentioned already, and uh, the daily probability density function of the five minutes return of a financial instrument, or daily probability distribution of the customer's expenditure, and so on. Well, this type of the curve series are real curve series in the sense you cannot piece them together into a long time series. Okay, this is the kind of motivation and uh, practical problem somehow demands the further uh, framework for the time series analysis. Okay, yeah, when we do the statistical modeling, we talk about time series process, we know in the classical case, we are guaranteed the probability structure can be well defined because of this Kolmogorov consistency theory, which says if we know all finite dimensional distribution of the process and all those finite dimensional distribution satisfy some consistency condition, then the prob probability measure of the whole process is well defined. Now we go one step further. What we are saying is for each time, we have a random curve defined on a set of i, a set of i. Then, this each curve is look is like a time series when you think about how to define its distribution, because you can apply the Kolmogorov consistency consistency theorem for finite dis, finite finite dimensional distribution to reach a uh, probability distribution for the whole curve. But that's not what we want. We want to do one step further. We say we can process each of them with a curve. So what you have is a theory presented in Boska's book in 2000. When you open the book, you will find the theory. Maybe on the surface, it looks almost like irrelevant from what I'm talking here. But uh, trust me, it answers the question we need, which is says if you have defined any finite dimensional distribution of the curve that satisfies some consistency, then this curve process has a well defined probability measure. Okay? This is not something I try to uh, discuss in great detail. What I'm trying to say is we talk about curve process, which can be well defined in the proper manner as a time series process. Okay, why we do that? Why we look at the curve time series? One of the motivations we try to do time series analysis in the current framework is try to embed, embed some non-stationary feature into a stationary framework. Okay? And we know the non-stationality is a kind of common uh, phenomenon whenever we analyze the data. Okay, very often you see some kind of non-stationary feature. Like the uh, example I mentioned, you look at the annual sales of a supermarket, of course, there will be a 
annual pattern, for example, during New Year, Christmas time, and people spend more money. And there is also kind of daily pattern, because typically in the evening, there will be more people to uh, shopping than during the day. And there is a weekly pattern, in the weekend, people go to supermarket more often than during the week. All those kind of non-stationary feature, which may cause a problem if we try to apply a classic time series uh, tool. But if you look this kind of data into a curve framework, those regular non-stationary feature can be embedded into a stationary framework in the Hilbert space. So that's one practical motivation we try to do that. Another reason we would like to do that is the technical convenience. You may say, okay, you look at the, at the annual chart of the temperature, which is practically a very long vector process, because although at each time you have temperature, you can record the temperature in a continuous curve, but practically, when you put the data into a computer, they are discretized. Therefore, what we're having is a high-dimensional vector process. But if you ignore, they are actually the curve in the sense curve are typically continuous, as we will assume in this talk. You lose some uh, technical convenience. Because when you do a high-dimensional vector, vector process analysis, you run into a typical problem nowadays is termed as a larger T, small n, or in some cases, larger T, larger n. And uh, the property of your estimation, the difficulty you have, will be different from, say, P is fixed. By looking at those data into a curve, technically, it's equivalent to a finite dimensional vector process. P is fixed. P is fixed. Because of the continuity. This will show up in the theoretical results as well. OK, this is the basic setting. We observe the, the time series curve, which we denote as y1 to yn. Can I have a point here? Yeah, OK. y1 to yn. We assume, we assume, the, observe the curve y is the true curve plus a noise curve. So x is the curve we are really interested in. You can say it's kind of annual chart or something. And epsilon, no, I'm fine. Sorry. Uh, I'm fine. Yeah. Epsilon is a white noise curve in the sense as long as T and S are different, they are uncorrelated. Okay, this is the condition. But for fixed T at a different position of the curve, they are not correlated. In the sense, if you think of a vector process, we do not require the covariance matrix of quiet noise to be aligned. Okay, this is the development of the machine. And we assume that everything here is stationary in the functional space. In the sense, the expected curve of x, the true curve, which we don't observe, is a curve independent of t. The covariance surface, because this is the surface of U, V, defined on the interval I and interval I. This, again, is independent of T, depends on the difference of the two curves. Okay. Yeah. So this is a weekly stationary process. Okay, with this condition, we know say the Cassani Loifer decomposition. For those who are not familiar with this decomposition, you definitely know there is a, a, a spectral decomposition for the non-negative definite matrix. In the sense, any non-negative definite matrix can be written as an orthogonal matrix times the diagonal matrix times the transpose of orthogonal matrix. This is the functional form. And those lambda is the elements on the diagonal matrix in the middle, which are the eigenvalue of this uh, non-negative definite matrix. So what we look at is the covariance of the curve, which is not a matrix. You can think of this for the easy understanding. You can think this is the infinity times infinity matrix. Okay. 
non-negative definition matrix. It do a uh, spectral decomposition. This is eigenvalue. So psi j are uh, eigenvector. Now, of course, are uh, functions, which are called eigenfunctions. And you have all those similar property as in the matrix case, in the sense those eigenvalues are non-negative. We arrange them in the descending order. And those eigenfunctions are orthogonal with each other in the sense that in the product of two eigenfunctions, in the vector case, it's a sum. In the functional space, it's an integration. Should be one if i equal to j, otherwise it's zero. So this is standard spectral decomposition. And uh, then we can write the original observed curve. No, an observed curve x, because this is a, this is the curve we are interested in, which we do not observe. X in terms of those eigenfunction and the eigenvalue. Okay? Because you can easily do easily do this decomposition. And uh, the loading here is a projector, the centered curve into the GS arch or GS function. This is just like in the micro case. And uh, because of we cent centralize the curve, therefore. Those loading a random variable has mean value zero, a variance is corresponding eigenvalue. Okay, because it's projected in the JS direction, it's variance. Sorry, it's a type, it should be lambda G, okay? J, J, lambda G. And uh, for different there, uh, for different I and J they are uncorrelated. So here we can see where this non-stationary feature or some of the non-stationary feature Went. Okay, we write the observe or the, the curve we are interested in into this format, and psi, the eigenfunction determined by the covariance space, are deterministic function. Okay, the randomness of the curve are determined by sequence of x e t j. Those are scales, and uh, like the seasonal feature, this non-stationary feature are embedded in the different argon functions. And uh, we, of course, we cannot deal with all non-stationary features. What we require is, in this framework, if you do this kind of decomposition, what comes out of here is kind of stationary function. OK. So what we can see from the uh, previous this question is, after doing those spectral analysis, the observed curve can be written as a mean curve plus the linear combination of the argon function with the loading determined by the projection. In general case, this should be sum should take from i to the 1 to infinity. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's a, as I said, you can see it as an infinity time, infinity matrix. It has an infinite number of arguments. In the paper by Hall and Beer, actually, they do not talk about the time series curve. They talk about independent curve, which is a much harder problem than the time series curve. I got the idea when I heard the talk given by Beer presented on this. I thought, okay, that the problem they try to solve is almost impossible to solve. I will tell you why. But if you add the dependence among the curve, the problem becomes solved. So what's, this is the concept so You do this uh, spectral decomposition. If it happened that d plus 1's largest eigenvalue is 0, that means there are only d non-zero eigenvalue. You call this curve is d dimension. Okay. Which is very nice. Because then you can see, we observe the y for x plus epsilon, you put this x in, then we observe the curve equal to a mean curve plus the d linear combination of other function which you don't know, then the coefficients are stochastic, those are random curves, and plus some white noise curve. So you put this d loaded together, this is a d-dimensional vector. Since we assume this is a white noise, 
The dynamic structure of Y is entirely determined by the dynamic structure of d dimensional vector process. In this way, we reduce the dimensionality. So, in a way, the whole exercise is not really trying to do a functional or uh, curve time series analysis. It's trying to transform this functional form into what we know the vector process. This is what we try. Okay. Now, it turns out to estimate, because in practice we only see one. We don't see anything on this part of the equation. Yeah? We only see one. To estimate each of those other functions is not trivial. Actually, it's not necessary. What we really need to do is to estimate the d dimensional space spanned by those d other functions. This is the trivial. Who said that? This much time? Richard told me the theory. In the last few years, you are only doing other analysis, and this is one of the examples. Yeah? I'm still doing other analysis. Okay. Now, why not estimate those other functions directly? Actually, there have been some work done by people in this university. Wolfgang did a paper, or maybe two papers, with some other people uh, talking about the curve time series using a similar idea and they try to estimate the target function directly. I will tell you why there is a shortcut to do this. Thing. Now, as we said, these are other functions determined by the covariance surface of XT, but we don't see XT. Therefore, you cannot apply the spectral decomposition directly. Because if you don't see XT, you cannot estimate the covariance surface of XT. What do you see in Y? Then you try this this is covariance, this is covariance surface of XT. You do the calculation from Y for X plus epsilon. What you have is this here. Okay. As we said, we don't assume this has a diagonal structure. But even you have a diagonal structure. It will destroy the property which is said this guy only has D non zero argument. Because epsilon may have more than D non zero argument. What do you see is the sum of those two. Now, if I remember correctly, Wolfgang may correct, uh, may correct me if I'm wrong. What they try to do is to figure out from an observed curve to try to separate epsilon from x. Okay. Or try to estimate both sides, try to estimate this covariance matrix. Take it away, then apply the structure matrix. Am I right? Yeah, I think I, I think I think I, I think this is the main idea, they try. Okay. As I said, I got this idea from people who are and real. What they try to do now? Because there is no dynamic structure, they have to start from here. And this problem is so hard. What they really did is to impose what they call a low noise condition, which effectively means when the sample size goes to infinity, you project the white noise into the orthogonal space of the dynamic space you try to estimate, this part will go to zero. In the sense, when the sample size goes to infinity, this white noise lives in the dynamic space you try to estimate. So it will not increase the number of non-zero argument as important. In this way, you can do it. And then, realize this is a not ideal situation, but so somehow, that we are, this is necessary to do that. Okay, what is our approach? As I said, by assuming this d dimensional structure, the, of the curve we are interested in this format, then instead of calculating the covariance xt with xt itself, we calculate the covariance at a different level, t and t plus k. 
and B prime A is another matrix. We know those two matrices share a non-zero argument. Yeah? You know the argument function is one, you can easily work out the argument function one. But this is for the matrix. And we can see in the function the space is also true. I'm not going to bother you with all the complicated equation. What I'm trying to do is say to why to operate I try to do the spectral decomposition in the matrix form is appears to be the matrix infinity time infinity. Okay? This form. This is just a kind of hand waving uh, intuitive explanation which can be justified properly. So now what I do, I see this is A, this is B. So I swap. Put Y0 prime in front. So I end with such a matrix. This is the n minus g times n minus g. Okay. I back to the uh, something I'm familiar. I don't need to worry with the L2, uh, the spectral matrix in the L2 space. I just do the final dimension of algorithms. And once you have the argon vector, which can be easily converted to the argon function I need. And the uh, nice thing about this approach is that the argon function you have here are the linear combinations of your observer term. Which in a way is you don't need to do all the uh, basic function expansion. Uh, okay. okay, so once you have that, you can easily do this kind of decomposition and then what you need is to do a d-dimensional back time series modeling. And once you have a time series model for this d-dimensional process, using this format, you can automatically have the end model for the control process. So this will be. Now, there is a non-trivial issue here. We said the d, the dimension of the process, is a number of non-zero eigenvalue of this k hat matrix. With anyone with some numerical experience will tell you, although in theory it should only have d non-zero eigenvalue, but when you do the uh, calculation due to a random fluctuation, all eigenvalues are non-zero. No matter some of them, how small some of them are. Okay. So you need to do kind of cut. What we propose here is kind of bootstrap test. And this is another interesting. We submit the paper, roughly like the paper, uh, AB like the paper, edit like the paper, but they all say you need to do more. What you need to do is prove this is a very good chef method. And uh, we thought for a while, eventually I said, we have to admit the defeat, we just cannot prove. I can't edit, I can't edit, I can't edit in the past. A, why did you not Surprise, surprise, A is in a file to accept the paper. Yeah. It never happened to me. So what do you 
will be, what you can do is project y into this other function. So it's a curve, project into a curve, you enter this curve. If d naught is true dimension, then this is the white noise. So it's an easy task. You just test a scale time shift in the white noise. But it turns out not so true. The linear model that is same kind of flavor of extreme value. Because you assume there are only d non zero from d plus one one to a zero. So in practice, what do you think? This is the d plus one largest value. Actually, it's the largest estimate for the all non zero. All zero are for each zero argument you can estimate each one which you but what you do is uh, you are not really working with this other measure. You are picking up the other function corresponding to this one. In a sense, this one is not an estimate for a fixed direction. It's kind of jumping in this zero other value space. So that's possible. That's why the classic form, the chi square, provides two small bit for this. The problem looks easy, but the depend on the monster. Okay. How much time I have? Now 
in the 391 minutes into God, this is how many in the day. And we use this kind of standard bandwidth to estimate all those curves. So what do we end with? What do she say? We have a best We try to see over the time and day to day how the lines of this density evolve. And this is the estimate for the bottom value. The first bottom value here, second, the third one, one more here. If you delete the first one, the one, the second one, one more is like this. And the bootstrap test carry you dimension in two in this case. And this is for the bottom value, which is just the profile of the density we have seen in the previous slide, although it's not the same size. This is the second one. And uh, this is the loading. When you look at the loading, there's still some kind of translation in feature you may argue. And uh, this is the basic of the loading, which is a two-dimensional process which I remark. And remarkably, there is hardly any cross-correlation between two components. And same by the PSD. Therefore, you can do a univariate modeling of each series.
You see, if I, I, I understand your question. We started with this stationary framework, stationary framework in the uh, in the given space. So, what do you describe the situation when not give me a kind of constant uh, uh, mean function and t independent uh, covariance surface? So, those kind of techniques were not applied. To make it, uh, yeah, we know that the local stationary version. Yeah. 